I want to get right into the Word tonight with our God and Government series and a message entitled, The Perils of a Paternalistic State. The Perils of a Paternalistic State. Immediately, I need to do a definition. What do we mean by a paternalistic state? What is paternalism? We usually recognize the root word as pater, or Latin means head or father. And here are some website definitions uh, from some secular websites. Here's a good one from the Stanford Encyclopedia of, of Philosophy. Paternalism is the interference of a state or an individual with another person against their will and defended or motivated by a claim that the person interfered with will be better off or protected from harm. Uh, there's a website called ivypanda.com. Paternalism can also be defined as an approach of a government on how its citizens should be contained in a fatherly manner for their own good. Thus, paternalistic government demands some kind of interference with an individual's personal wishes, but of course always for their own good. Now, with these definitions in mind, I'll just tell you where I'm going uh, to say ungodly politicians gain political power using a paternalistic approach in governance, whereby the state becomes the father and provider to the people, titles that rightly belong only to God. Now, I'm taking our text tonight from a rather puzzling passage from Jesus in Matthew 23, verse 9. I'll never forget the first time I read this. I, I I said, what, did he, what does he mean? Because he says, and call no man on earth your father. Call no man on earth your father. For one is your father, he who is in heaven. And I remember, just as a baby believer, reading that and wondering what he meant. Uh, one guy told me, he says, well, that Jesus was preaching because he knew the Catholic Church would call their pastor's father. And I said, oh, really? And uh, never really satisfied me. But sometimes, let me give you a hint. Sometimes the, the most puzzling passages have some of the greatest truths. If, you can, if the Holy Spirit can help you kind of work through the issue, show you something some of these passages that first reading are hard to understand really are gold mines. But what did Jesus mean when he said not to call anyone father? Now it's obvious that he was not forbidding us to refer to our earthly fathers by their proper title. Since God commands us to honor our father and mother, and there are many places in the New Testament where earthly fathers are called fathers. Bible scholars agree. Uh, Albert Barnes says, this does not, of course, forbid us to apply the term to our real father. The Bible requires all proper honor to be shown to him. But the word father also denotes authority, eminence, superiority, the right to command, and a claim to particular respect. And in this sense, it is used here as a term that belongs only to God, and it is not right to give it to anyone else. Now, when a nation gives government the right to function as a father, there will be problems. And that's my message tonight, the perils of a paternalistic government. Now, I'll cover these several topics as quickly as I can, but begin by saying that the primary function of a father in the Bible is provision. Provision. The paternal function is primarily providential. 
The father provides food in the biblical model. The father provides shelter. The father provides protection and security. The father, of course, along with the mother, provides education. Jesus came to reveal the nature of God as father. It's interesting, if you read the Old Testament, the nation of Israel understood their God as Jehovah, Lord of hosts, uh, understood God as, in some ways as healer. But Jesus specifically revealed God as father, which was in many ways a new concept to the Jewish mind. And he connected the father with provision. All of us know the Lord's Prayer, for example. I, I had many scriptures, uh, which I'm, not, I'm leaving out for time's sake, but um, I'll focus on the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, verses 9 and 11. Jesus says, Our Father, who art in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. So how many of you can see he's connecting the Father function with provision? Uh, Albert Barnes went on to say that Bible scholars agree that this prayer is not limited to physical food. He says the word bread here doubtless refers to everything necessary to sustain life. This petition implies our dependence on God for the supply of all our needs. Another Puritan commentator said, bread is a common and natural figure that signifies the necessities of life. God's providence is our surest estate. God's fatherly care, our most certain and comfortable support. This prayer is an acknowledgement of our entire and constant dependency on God. Now from this prayer, we are beginning to see what Jesus meant by forbidding us to call anyone on earth our father. He was teaching that we must not show or allow anyone or anything on earth to replace our dependence on the Father God for our provision. And that would include paternalistic government. Herbert Schlossberg, in his classic book, Idols for Destruction, says the father is the symbol not only of authority, but also of provision. Jesus taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. Therefore, looking to the state for sustenance is an act of cultic worship. In his book, The Politics of Jesus, John Howard Yoder agrees. He says, we rightly learn to expect food from parents. But when we regard the state as the source of physical provision, we render to it the obeisance of idolatry. The crowds who had fed on the multiplied loaves and fishes were ready to receive Christ as their king or ruler, not because of who he was, but because of the provision he had given them. You read the story in John 6, when the multitude followed him into the wilderness and he fed them all miraculously, they were immediately wanting to install him as their king because they were looking to the provision that he had given. Yoder says, the distribution of bread moved the crowd to acclaim Jesus as the new Moses, the provider, the welfare king that they had been waiting for. Now, this principle still applies to many people today. People pick their politicians according to who will promise to provide them with the most and biggest benefits. They replace the Father God with the Father State. This is nothing less than a form of idolatry. And I say this prophetically, our nation, beloved, has fallen into idolatry 
because many Americans, including Christian pastors and people, have forsaken trust in God as their father and provider and are now looking to the state as their father and provider of their needs. Now, I say that on good authority. You just have to look at the election results to see how successful these folks are who make paternalistic promises of provision to potential voters. And surveys also tell us that Christians vote for these people in, in mass. So it's not something that just appeals to worldly people. When a majority of the people in a nation come to the place where they put their trust in government instead of in God, we put ourselves into the perils of the paternalistic state, which becomes an increasingly totalitarian system. And this has not happened overnight, as we shall see. We have had our warnings about paternalistic government. God has sent teacher prophets over the years to give us a warning, but they have been largely ignored. The great uh, theologian Helmut Thielich says, a totalitarian state acts as a universal father, the state which intervenes in all things, exploiting the inner powers of man, registering everything, and laying claim to everything, thus transgressing its allotted sphere and assuming the role of a pseudo-church. He goes on, the totalitarian state this gives me sh shivers. The totalitarian state seeks to penetrate every sphere of life and hence to take over the care of the children, the chronically ill, the sick, and the aged. It plays the role of the universal father attending men with its claims and services from the cradle to the grave and forcing on them dependence on the state in all spheres of life. You see, for you and I, it becomes a question of who do we truly ultimately depend on? Who, who are we dependent upon for our provision? And this raises the question of how a free people become willing to give this much power to politicians and I believe it's because sinful nature in our flesh, we're quite willing to let someone else take care of us, especially if that someone says they want to do it for our own good and because they are so compassionate and because they care about us so much. Schlossberg says politicians pick up on the desire for security and dependency and use it for permanent political gain. The idle state uses the language of compassion because its intention is messianic. It sees the masses harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd needing a savior. They say they want to save us, but what they really want is power. Two generations ago, the great H.L. Mencken, uh, a journalist, not a believer, but a, a very brilliant journalist said, the urge to save humanity is almost always a false front for the urge to rule humanity. So the Lord helping me, I want to run through four particular perils or dangers that come upon a nation that looks to a paternalistic government. Are you with me on that? Yes. Good. Three of you are with me. It will create a culture of dependency. It will offer security in exchange for freedom. It will increase taxes and decrease law enforcement. 
Let's do the first one. It creates a culture of dependent people. Economists Robert Bradley and Richard Fulmer point out how America's increasingly dependent on paternalistic government. And it's expressed in how we look to the state to solve all our problems. They say continual calls for government action highlight a concerning belief among a wide portion of the American public that when faced with an economic, social, or political problem, we should look first to government to do something about it and that the government's response will be in our best interest. These calls for action demonstrate not only Americans' acceptance of paternalistic government practices, but our demand for even more. As a professor of political science, Bradley says, I see this attitude manifest among my students with regularity. And as a pastor, I can truly say the same thing. My personal observation is that looking to the state to solve our problems has increased exponentially in my life. I was born in 1944, had a birthday Tuesday. Thanks for the gifts you didn't give. It's okay. But I was raised in a, in a family that taught self-government and personal responsibility so that when we were going through hard times or difficulties, the message from my father was, you need to work harder. You need to get a second job. You need to improve yourself. Read more books. Get yourself educated. Today, when families go through issues, they want the government to do something about it. That's becoming, well, I believe it is, the default mode. Whenever there is a recession, economic crisis, health pandemic, the default now in the cultural mindset is the government needs to do something about this. Older Americans like me are shocked and appalled at the amount of government overreach that this younger generation seems to swallow without a whimper. Bradley and Fulmer explain why this is. The subtle consequence to increases of status power is that each new generation comes to view the exercise of this power as normal. The government's power becomes a normative baseline for subsequent action. Paternalism becomes the norm. As citizens come to expect paternalistic policies, they become inclined to view as ineffective any politicians who act otherwise. Did you follow that? In other words, the voter, especially the younger voter, is beginning to have a perception that recognizes the language of paternalism and it appeals to them as compassionate and caring and th they really want to help me. Whereas a politician who is more conservative and who does present a message of personal responsibility and self-government that preaches meritocracy and capitalism, that voice is less appealing. And as a result, we get the, the people we have now. Recent elections demonstrate how paternalism determines electability. Those who offer us an easy street lifestyle get elected. 
There was an article recently in the Epoch Times by Mark Hendrickson. He said, we all have probably imagined a life of ease at some time in our lives. The dream or notion of arriving at the proverbial easy street has been a recurring theme in America for generations. The Democrat Party seems to want to make that dream a reality for all Americans with its plans for government to ensure that all Americans have cradle-to-grave security. The paternalistic welfare state in which the state assumes economic responsibility for citizens aligns with the progressives' long-standing utopian goal of legislating a risk-free environment. Ooh, I could just go off on that. The vision that's presented is put me in power, elect me, and I will make sure to bring about a risk-free culture. Don't worry about going bankrupt. Don't worry about those loans you can't repay. Don't worry about, don't worry about health care. Don't worry about anything. I, we, we're, you won't be at risk because we're going to be here to help you. It sounds fatherly, but it's actually not. Gary DeMars pointed out that the perils of a paternalistic state is how it resembles a bad parent. He says the paternalism of the state is that of the bad parent <clears throat> who wants his children dependent on him forever. This is an evil Im impulse. The good parent prepares his children for independence, trains them to make responsible decisions. The good parent knows that he harms his children by not helping them to break loose. Now, I'm going to be a little transparent, a little personal, and I hope I don't offend you, but I probably will offend some of you, but I'm going to do it anyway because I believe that our country is replete with poor parenting today as evidenced by the fact that so many full-grown adults now are still living with their parents. You know, back in the day, by the time you were 18 and out of high school, you were expected to launch out on your own. You were expected to begin your own household and to demonstrate your self-government by taking care of yourself. Now in cases where you had kids in college or there were, I'm not saying that's across the board true, there, there's places where that's okay, but folks, we've got 29, 30, 35 year olds living at home. And nobody thinks anything of it because it's become normal. But friends, it is not normal. It's not biblical. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. The, the point of growing up and taking responsibility is personal responsibility. And the whole key to growing up is to get out from under the care that your parents have given you all their lives to get you through school so that you can go out and be at, well, it, that's a risk. That's what life is all about. I mean, even God the Father didn't promise a risk-free existence or a risk-free lifestyle. Years ago, somebody said, you spell faith, R-I-S-K. I, I preached a message years ago on that. There's no faith without risk. Every time you use your faith, you're taking a risk. And, and, and God the Father likes that because he wants us to, to grow up. Are you still there? And these are not bad parents in the sense that they're evil or intentionally 
uh, doing something wrong, they just don't realize how they're harming their children and the children don't realize how they'll never come to full maturity as long as they allow their parents to provide for them. Moving right along. Even good parents can miss the fact that the main point of parenthood is to prepare their children to provide for themselves. I mean, if there's one thing, and we, we talk about this now, of course, our kids are long grown, gone, have their own kids, and so it, it's like we, we're, but you do get a perspective as you look back and say, you know, and, and by the way, no one is really happy if they're honest with their own parenting. Uh, it's, it's a tough job. And when you look back, you say, well, I, I didn't do this, or I could have done that, or I should have done this, or I should not have done that, or whatever. But one of the things that, that we, we have both pretty much agreed on is that the times in our lives where we have tried to save our children from going through some things, were some of the worst decisions we ever made. Now, I'm not talking, and again, I feel like i got to qualify everything so I don't get in trouble. I mean, if your kid is in, is in a crisis and they need $1,000 and you can help them with $1,000, I'm not talking about that, friends. I'm talking about the mentality that they can't do their homework. I'm going to do it for them. You know, it's just too hard. By the time I've let them sit here all night and they're crying because they don't know how to figure it, and I, I'm, I'm just going to sit down here and I'll do it. For, folks, we, we've had parents that do the home, all the homework for the kids. Write the papers for the kids. That is a terrible, terrible mistake. And the culture is now at the point where we can't let our kids fail. You play, you know, you go play baseball. You're on the worst team in the league, but you got to get a trophy because all the the winners get trophies, and we sure don't want you to feel less than. So you may be the worst ball player in the city, but you, you we got to give you something, friends. That is, that is paternalism. Okay. Let's close in prayer. The only hope is to break the cycle of dependency that turns people into parasites. Schlossberg says the paternal state thrives on dependency. When the dependents free themselves, the state will lose power. The paternal state is parasitic upon the very persons whom it turns into parasites. Unchecked, the state and its dependents will march symbiotically to destruction. In other words, we will either break free, free of this paternalism in the state or we will continue to submit ourselves to this God of a state that keeps us in dependency. And there is a level. The great C.S. Lewis once said, once we sink to this level of dependency on a paternalistic government, there's no point in telling state officials to mind their own business. Our whole lives are their business. Number two, the state will offer you security in exchange for freedom. Now, I've spoken about this a lot during the pandemic. Here we go again. Many Americans look to the government during the pandemic, blind to the dangers that, involved, that came about, which was primarily governmental overreach. Gary DeMar in his book, Liberty at Risk, says, without a proper understanding of civil government's biblical function and limited jurisdiction, Christians can be trapped into believing that civil government should promote policies beyond its designed purpose as long as they're for the good of the people. This reasoning can lead many to choose security, no matter what the cost, to liberty. If you were here with us back during the pandemic, we closed this church down for, uh, I think, two or three weeks. The government asked us to do it. I felt it was reasonable. No one knew what we were dealing with at the time. Um, not 
kicking myself for doing that. But it became quickly obvious to me that the government was overreaching, overstepping, using the crisis to increase their power over the culture, over businesses, churches, schools. And I preached on that choice before us, which is freedom or security or safety. Now, we all want freedom and we all want security. But there can be times in life when you go through a crisis where you might have to choose which do you value more freedom or safety and many americans make the wrong choice safety security is important we all crave it it's it's not sinful it's it's natural we want to be safe we want to be secure but we were put in a position where to keep our security, our safety, to keep our jobs at times, to go the places we want to go, we had to give up freedom. And this was a dangerous precedent for what else would come and still may come. Does that make sense? Yes. It's, uh, it, to me, it's, it's just, it's crystal clear. Many years ago, one of my favorite, uh, I think she was one of England's greatest prime ministers, Margaret Thatcher, the Iron Lady. She talked about that dynamic uh, with the people of Athens. She says, more than they wanted freedom, the Athenians wanted security, yet they lost everything, security, comfort, and freedom. This was because they wanted not to give to society, but for society to give to them. The freedom they were seeking was freedom from responsibility. It is no wonder then they ceased to be free. In the modern world, we should recall the Athenians' dire fate whenever we confront demands for increased state paternalism. Now, the Athenians weren't Christians. In other words, we should know better. But the paternalistic state will promise us safety in exchange for our freedoms, and the, end, and the end is we'll end up with neither. We won't have safety or security. We end up with the state as our father, overseeing more and more of our lives than ever before. Schlossberg says the paternal state not only feeds its children, but nurtures educates, comforts, and disciplines them, providing all they need for their security. This appears to be a mildly insulting way to treat adults, but it's really a great crime because it transforms the state from being a gift of God given to protect us against violence into an idol. It supplies us with all blessings, and we look to it for all our needs." Point three, the paternalistic state and government will always require huge increases in taxes. Gary DeMar says the Bible tells us that God is our father, but more often than not, the people make the state their father because the state supposedly can provide us with all the financial aid we need. Of course, in order to accomplish this miracle, the state must confiscate capital from the most productive members of society or create money out of thin air. Both these actions are immoral, tyrannical, and self-defeating. The proof we've moved this direction can be seen in the current attacks on free market capitalism and the promotion of promises of prosperity through the Marxist socialist politicians that now inhabit the halls of power. Remember this. This paternalistic system of government always takes us towards socialism. History tells us that. And will require huge increases in taxation. And socialists know 
This will eventually kill capitalism, which is their greatest enemy. Karl Marx says, said, thank God he's not saying anything anymore. The only way to kill capitalism is by taxes, taxes, and more taxes. Of course, most of the modern-day American Marxists will never admit they're Marxists. They call themselves now the latest one is progressives. Really sounds great, huh? We're progressives. We're making progress. We're going forward. But two generations ago, H.L. Mencken said, a progressive is one who's in favor of more taxes instead of less, more bureaus, more paternalism, and more meddling, more regulation of private affairs, and less liberty. In general, he would be inclined to regard the repeal of any tax as outrageous. You can always tell, friends, who's paternalistic. They're always for more taxes. And you can always tell who's more biblical because they're always wanting to reduce taxes. It's really just about that simple. One generation ago, Secretary of Agriculture Ezra Taft Benson warned us how socialistic paternalism always destroys an economy. He said, we should know that paternalism, collectivism, or unnecessary federal supervision will hold down our standard of living and reduce productivity, just as it has in every country where it has ever been tried. Thomas Sowell once said, the great thing about socialism is it sounds so good. The worst thing about it is it never works. Paternalistic governments, fourthly, not only will have an increase in taxes, but the decrease in justice. Has anybody besides me ever wondered what's happened to justice in America? Why is there more concern for the criminals than for the victims? Why are the innocents locked up and the crooks being set free? See, this is, this, is not, this is something I needed teachers to help me understand because I didn't really make the connection naturally. But Gary DeMar says that once the state gains power, its rulers work relentlessly to maintain power. Since the state gained power by promising the masses security, it must offer more security to maintain its power. So power inevitably replaces justice which is the true role of civil government. Now again, we've covered this briefly in previous messages in this series, but if you go look at the biblical definition for the jurisdiction of a proper government, it's primarily to enforce the law and keep us safe from crooks, lock up the bad guys, E even execute the, the, those who commit capital crimes. That's why Romans 13 says, the state bears not the sword in vain. He was, he was speaking about the role, the proper role of government. But when, you, when a government, all it's thinking about all the time is getting reelected, and all they're thinking about is serving themselves and voting themselves more pay raises, which they just did again recently. Do you know about that? They have no time for their real job, which is justice. A paternalistic government, consider the border. I mean, a lot of this, what's going on in, in Ukraine, as bad as it is, and we need to pray for the situation, but I'm just telling you, it's a distraction. I mean, everybody's consumed with what the you know, with how the Russians crossed the Ukrainian border, but we got over two million illegal a aliens who have come across our southern border virtually uncontested. Matter of fact, we, get, we reward them for breaking the law. Oh, you're an illegal. Well, just come on in. What city would you like to live in? Mm, Palm Springs. 
Okay, need a bus for Palm Springs. Here's, a, here's some money to tide you over. And here's a car that'll get you free health care. This will get your kids in school. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm getting off on a tangent. But the problem is, as Schlossberg says, when the provision of paternal security replaces the provision of justice as the function of the state, the state stops providing justice. This artificial and inferior substitute parent ceases executing judgment against those who violate the law and the nation begins losing the benefits of justice. Remember, folks, he wrote this 30 years ago. How much more true is it today? Those who are concerned about the chaos into which the criminal justice system has fallen should consider what the state's function has become. Because the state can only be a bad imitation of a father, like a dancing bear act is of a ballerina. <laughs> The protection of this Leviathan of a father will turn out to be a fatal bear hug. So I need to land the plane. I'll review those four perils. I had, I was trying to keep the, this message is too long. There's too much information, but you should see what I left on the cutting room floor. And you'd be thanking me. You'd be saying, thank God he didn't use all that stuff. But we saw... It will create a culture of dependency, offer security in exchange for freedom, increase taxes, and decrease law enforcement and justice. That's what we've said. Quick review. I'm coming to a close. Jesus told us, call no man on earth our Father except God. Jesus taught us to look to the Father for our provision. But the paternalistic state presents itself to the people as their father provider. And therefore, if we look to the state as father, instead of God, we are in idolatry. And we need to repent. Schlossberg says the state will promise to provide us for us whatever God could not, because it has replaced God. In the hands of the theologians of the political redemption, therefore, the state is an idol. History teaches us that when a nation comes to depend on the state instead of God, it is on the border of bondage. I don't want to sound too scary, but I came across uh, something written A couple hundred years ago, a, Scotland, a, a Scottish professor of history at the University of Edinburgh, his name was Alexander Teitler, and he formulated something famous called the life cycle of civilizations. He studied world history, and he studied the nations of the world, and he came up with a cycle that was common to all of them, even some of the great empires. He said, civilizations begin, they go from bondage to spiritual faith. Then they go from spiritual faith to great courage. Then they go from courage to liberty and from liberty to abundance. That's the upside. But then they go from abundance to selfishness, from selfishness to complacency, from complacency to apathy, from apathy to dependency, and from dependency back into bondage. If you're ever going to take a picture of a slide, that would be the one. That you could think about this. You can look at world history. You can see this is true. I believe those first four made America great. I mean, that's, this, that's America. Bondage to faith. Faith to courage. Courage to liberty. Liberty to abundance. But what's been happening the last 50 years? We've gone from abundance to selfishness. Selfishness to complacency complacency to apathy 
How many of you know what I'm preaching tonight? There are a lot of young people. They wouldn't even sit through it. You talk to your grandkids, you'll find out. They don't know what's going on. They don't even care. They don't want to be bothered with it. Too busy looking at their cell phone. Because once you get into apathy, you go to dependency. And that's what I preached about tonight. And if we don't break free from that, we go back into bondage. I'm going to close with the prayer from 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Because as dire as it is, because I'm a realist. I'm an optimist, but I'm also a realist. I mean, if you've been around me very long, you know I believe we're going to win. I do believe God will save America. I just don't know if he's going to do it in my lifetime. He is sovereign. I mean, he, he left uh, Israel in Babylon for 70 years. You know, Russia was under uh, serious communism for 70 years before the Berlin Wall fell. I don't know. I just know that this is a serious moment. But we have, we have faith in a God who can do it. And God himself said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Father, we pray this tonight together as a people. And we ask you, Lord, to light a fire in the hearts of your people in America. I pray there will be an awakening to truth and a fresh longing for liberty. I pray, Lord, that you will expose the unfruitful works of darkness, that you will cause the light to shine, that you will bring about your prophetic word that explains and illuminates the events that, that grieve us so much each day, day by day, and that you would cause us, Lord, to be a people of prayer, a people willing to repent before you, a people who would humble themselves and call on your name as our true Father. I ask you to forgive us for looking or calling anyone Father but you when it comes to our provision our great provider. Father, we have made an idol and a savior out of politics. We ask you to forgive us as we repent. We humble ourselves before you and we ask you to deliver us from the bondage. Keep us from evil in your name. Amen. 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 All right. We love you. We are in faith. We're believing together. God is, God is, is in charge. And he, he, he was all about getting us going as a country. All you have to do is read what happened that gave us our birth. You've got to be inspired by that. And, and also inspired to make sure we don't Betray that heritage. Amen. And everybody has a part in this. Every one of us. Not just the preachers. Every man, every woman, every boy and every girl has a part to play in this. And I believe he will help us.